So there's a, there's a story that is told of a, of a guy who's walking down a sidewalk outside of a playground. And if you can picture this playground, it's probably on a, a block, a square block, and there's a tall wooden fence that surrounds this entire playground. And as the man is walking, he hears some kids, and, and, and what he hears the kids chanting is, 13, 13, 13. And he's curious, as some of us probably would be. So he stops and, and he, and he kind of kneels down. He finds a, a hole inside the fence and he, and he looks up into the hole. And as soon as he does that, he gets poked in the eye. And immediately after the finger poked him in the eye, the chanting continues. But now the kids are screaming, 14, 14, 14. <laughs> How many of you would have done that as a kid? Come on. Be honest. We're in the house of the Lord. That has me written all over it, truthfully. But I actually think I probably would not have been uh, brave enough or, 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 I guess, bold enough to actually be the one who poked because I'd be afraid my finger would be grabbed and it'd be broken off or something. But I probably would have come up with the idea and then had some other kid do that. But anyway, I, I, told, I heard this story, and the first time I heard this story, it was told within the context of church life. And so I thought it was a, a fitting introduction to this week's message in our, in our series, our ongoing series in community and connection. And uh, no doubt, the reason why it's fitting, no doubt there are times when doing life together, when being together can feel less like a, a pat on the back and much more like a poke in the eye. Sometimes being together, doing community, can feel less like a pat on the back and an encouragement and more like a poke in the eye and hurt. And last week, what we did was we looked at John 13, and we focused on how the, this highest form, this highest ideal of love, agape, is both a command of Jesus, and it's a powerful force for change when we seek and choose to do life together. But, but of course, the thing is, in contrast, loving poorly can be devastating, and loving poorly can have profound consequences in our communal life. And we know that in relationship, we inevitably will face challenge, Right? I don't know if you say amen to something like that, but in relationship, we're going to face challenge. There's always, always opportunity for hurt in community. And a, a relevant question for us, if this is true, that there will always be these, these possibilities of hurt. So the question for us, I think, as followers of the way of Jesus Christ is, what are we going to do about it? In what manner are we going to handle our hurts? Is it going to look any different than, than maybe the world what instruction does, does the scripture offer to help us navigate through our personal offenses, our hurt feelings, or wrongdoings against us? Being poked in the eye is the most challenging part of doing life together, isn't it? And so I think it's only fitting that this morning we take a look at some extremely radical teaching given by our rabbi Jesus on this topic of forgiveness. And I include this topic in our community and connection series because when... Not if, but when our agape, this highest ideal of love, when our agape falls short, we are challenged by Jesus to respond in a particular manner. And open your Bibles if you have them, or it'll be on the screen, Matthew chapter 18, on your phones, your, your Bible app. We're going to pick up in, in verse 21. I'll be using the, the New International Version, Matthew chapter 18. Beginning in verse 21, we read this. And Peter, he came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Basically, offense happens in community. Up to seven times. Verse 22, Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Now, I'm just going to stop there because before we examine Peter and Jesus' conversation, it's actually really helpful to understand the broader and larger context of this chapter. If we're, if we're to look back a few verses, Jesus is, is actually teaching about a path toward reconciliation when there's conflict. In other words, when someone else has done you wrong, when someone else has, has messed up, when someone else has sinned against you, what do you do? Verse 15, he says... If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. But before you do that, make sure you post it, you know, passive aggressively on Facebook to hope that they see it and, and they get that. I'm sorry, it doesn't say that. That's a, that's a, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. 
But if they will not listen, take one or two others so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Verse 17, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, we read this and we're wounded. We're like, we're like yeah, treat them like a pagan and a tax collector. Come on, give them what they deserve. Yeah, yeah, to heck with them. Expel them from the community. Kick them out because they hurt me. Let me ask you a very important and overarching gospel contextual question. While looking at all of the gospel accounts, how exactly did Jesus treat the pagan sinner and the tax collector? Because he's saying treat them like the pagan and tax collector. How did Jesus treat the pagan sinner and the tax collector. You can go check this out. There's lots of places in the Gospels that talk about this. And, and please notice how, how offensive Jesus' behavior and the way that he treated the sinner and the tax collector was to the religious leader. They, they had a system. They had a metric that they used. And, more than, and, and even more in this moment, in this moment, Jesus is communicating something. Now, I suspect that the origin of the phrase, you're dead to me, that Kevin O'Leary uses often on the show, The Shark Tank, is probably, it might have its origins uh, in, this, in this moment. But it's not the origin that we're asked. It's not the way that we're supposed to respond as Christ followers. Because Jesus, in the gospel accounts, if you look at him, he didn't disassociate with people who lived in sin. Rather, what we see Jesus doing over and over again is he stayed with him. He didn't condone sin. He did not condone sin by staying proximate to the sinner. I just want to make that very clear. Jesus' propensity to not kick people to the curb is the fundamental thing that, that we have to understand if we're going to make any sense of what Jesus says next. Because as Peter is hearing Jesus' guidance on, on resolving conflict in verses 15 to 19, it's clear that, that he noticed something that, that we might notice while reading this. And that is that at first, Jesus offers no guidance, no guidance on how many attempts should be made for reconciliation in that in that conflict resolution passage. In other words, what Jesus didn't say here is just as important as what he did say, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. In the meantime, what Peter does is he wants to take a stab at this parameter issue, this, this metric issue, and wanting to be generous, what he does is he, he answers his own question with, a, with another question, and what he believes is gonna be this extravagant limit. He says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? I'll tell you this much, Peter thought that he was being all that and a, and a bag of chips by using the number seven because the number seven in, in Hebrew uh, culture, it's a number of, uh, of tr it's number of completion. It implies finality. It, it implies totality. And Peter would have known that, that rabbis, this is, this is key, Peter would have known that rabbis taught that a person should forgive someone only a maximum of three times. And then after that, they were to be excluded. They were to be excommunicated from the community. So Peter, he's like, ah, I know that. In fact, we were just talking about that in the past little couple words before. He adds more than double to what was the common practice of the day. Peter knew that he's going beyond the normal bounds of forgiveness. So imagine his surprise when Jesus said, I tell you not seven times, Pete, not seven times, but 77 times. And then he tells us a story about how things will work when, when there's sin and offense and brokenness in a community. But he, but he flips the script in the story he tells that we're about to read. It's in our gospel. He stresses that as much as you look at the sin in the other person who's offended you and done you wrong, you need to look in the mirror first. What's your posture? And picking up in verse 23, he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. He, he begged I mean, he began the settlement, and, and, a, and a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that they had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the, the servant falls to his knees before him, and he says, be patient with me. He begs this, and, and, I, and I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him. He canceled the debt, and he let him go. Verse 28, but when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins and he, he grabbed him and he began to choke him and he says, pay me back what I owe you. And he demanded this and his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will, I will pay you back. But he refused. 
Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Verse 32, then the master called the servant in. He said, you wicked servant. I canceled all the debts of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in, in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back what he owed. Verse 35. This is how the Heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Church, in that story, Jesus is basically describing, he's describing a man who, who basically owed this king a, a millions of dollars. And the king threatens to sell the whole family into, into slavery until those debts get paid, which is never going to happen. It's absolutely impossible. And the, the servant falls to his knees, and he, he begs the king for a chance to repay the debt. And in a shocking turn of events in this parable, as Jesus, the master Middle Eastern storyteller, would do, the king cancels it all, and he, and he lets him go. And Jesus telling this story literally just flips everything around, turns the tables. He wants Peter and others who are listening. He wants you and me who are listening to be inserted into this story to identify with the debt of this man. But instead of money owed, it's the sin in our lives that we hold as debt, isn't it? And Jesus wants folks to understand that God will deal mercifully and radically with us when we ask for pardon and because God himself treats us with extravagant forgiveness and love, when it comes to Christian community, we remember that. So before we, we justify how we might treat those who hurt us, even those who are not asking for forgiveness on our timetable, or maybe they, they do ask for, for forgiveness, but, but you know what, then they turn around and, and do it again. Before we justify how we might treat them, that is, kick them to the curb, we remember the words of Jesus, the one who models extravagant agape love and forgiveness to us. And just how extravagant was his love. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Before we ever said, I'm sorry, he made a way. And C.S. Lewis summarizes this best, I think, when he says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. To be a Christian is to excuse the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. That's a, that's a mic drop. And then, and then Jesus continues the parable, and we notice another surprising twist, and the part where we should really insert ourselves after being forgiven so much. This, this dude meets a friend who owes him literally just a few dollars, and he forgets all about how he was just extravagantly treated by the king, and he demands that his debts be repaid immediately. And the, the friend similarly falls to his knees as he had done with the king, and he says, be patient with me, I'll pay you back. But the man refuses his friend's request and he has him thrown in, in prison until he could repay the debt, which is impossible because you cannot work in prison. No mercy, no kindness. King finds out, calls for the servant to appear before him and he says, you wicked servant. I canceled all of the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have shown mercy to your fellow servant just as I have shown you? And then Jesus finishes this parable and he, he offers these really sobering words. In anger, his master turned to him. He turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back what he owed. That's how the heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Yikes. What is Jesus saying there? Jesus is saying that holding unforgiveness has dire consequences for us. And, and let, me come at this, uh, let me come at this another way. We sang about this in the Lord's Prayer. Do you, realize, do you realize that Jesus teaches that we are actually forgiven to the extent that we forgive others? Are you aware of that? That we are forgiven to the extent that we forgive others? Wait, what? Yeah. We say this in the Lord's Prayer every week. We say, Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's a radical rally cry for deep heart level forgiveness, church. And I got to ask, have you ever gone to the place where you just wanted to kick someone to the curb? Anybody been wounded or hurt so much that you wanted to kick them to the curb and as you kicked them and struck them, you wanted them to bleed? Have you ever been that hurt? 
because they've done so much wrong to you. You just want to scream in their face, you are dead to me. Who's wounded you? Who has hurt you? In Mark eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Folks, we, we can't have love without forgiveness, and we can't have forgiveness without love. And Jesus sets this incredibly, incredibly high standard, one that we can't even do unless we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, amen? Unless we, and we need to put on Christ and all of who he is so we can live radically like this. And in Luke's gospel, Jesus tells, you, it tells us, but I tell you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Wait, what? Jesus, didn't you just tell us in Matthew 18 to to treat them like pagans and and tax collectors? Didn't you say that? Oh, right, oh, right, Jesus, you meant the way that you treated sinners and tax collectors. You didn't give up on them. Oh, right, 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 right. And that's that's why you said 70 times 7 when Peter asked you, how many times do I need to forgive someone who sins against me? But I think we're probably more like Peter. We say, Jesus, that's just too dang gone hard. I prefer you just give me the number straight up, Jesus. In fact, I kind of like the number that was there already back in culture. Three's enough, thank you. And then I'll kick him to the curb. Jesus says, we don't do that. In the same chapter, he even talks about going after the lost sheep. That's that's radical. The lost and sinful sheep, that that pagan and and tax collector sheep, was not let go. What did he do? He sought after him. That's how Jesus taught the the pagan, or, or, or interacted with the pagan and tax collector. Is that easy? This is where you say no. It's just honest. That it's not easy. And of course, we struggle when issues and differences divide us, when people hurt us. But again, our two overarching themes in this series that, that we've been inserting each week are our need for intentionality and the corresponding opportunity. We must be intentional in forgiving, and the opportunity for, for, for life and love will be profound. When we bear the weight of unforgiveness, we are keeping ourselves in prison it's very possible that a person may, may never come to you and say, I'm so sorry and grovel at your feet. But if you hold unforgiveness against them, you are punishing yourself with the weight of that. And you know you felt it yourself and you know people who are living in that prison right now in this moment because they cannot forgive someone. Every one of us has been wrong. We've all been wronged. It's a part of life, to be sure, and yet we are taught by Jesus in his response to Peter and in the parable what God offers us in the gospel. I I know that forgiving others is, is perhaps the hardest thing we are asked to do as followers of Jesus, especially when the person knows exactly what they're doing. Come on. What then? What if that offense is intentional and and purposeful towards us? What then? Take the matter into our own hands. Romans 12, 19 says, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And the lesson in that verse is to forgive even if the offender does not seek reconciliation or ask for pardon because God is the ultimate judge. God is God and you are not. When you are trying to to get somebody to change because they've hurt you so bad, in some ways you're, you're trying to play God. God's the ultimate judge. St. Chrysostom said, we are more like God. Get this, come on. We are more like God in the act of forgiveness than at any other moment. To forgive is to be like God. And I'll close today with a true story that captures the heart of of Jesus and, and his capacity to forgive in this 
radical power of forgiveness that we just try to harness the best we can within community. You're probably familiar with this story. October 2006, a 32-year-old milk truck driver storms into an Amish school. And as you read the details about that event, he releases all the boys, he releases all the adults, but he ties up 10 girls. And he shot all the girls, he kills five of them, he wounds the other five, and then he takes his own life. That is shocking violence. And it resulted in profound anguish in the Amish community, but no anger. There was hurt, but no hate. In fact, their forgiveness was almost reflexive and immediate. Collectively, they began to reach out to the milkman's suffering family. When the milkman's family gathered in his home the day after the shooting, an Amish gentleman showed up, came over, wrapped his arms around the father of the dead gunman, and he said, we will forgive. And then Amish leaders, they visited the milkman's wife and children to extend their sympathy, their forgiveness, their help, and their love. About half of the mourners, half of the mourners at the milkman's funeral were Amish. And in turn, the Amish invited the milkman's family to attend the funeral services for those five girls that he shot and killed. Church, when I read that story, I ask the question, how is the Amish response to pure evil, to sin, how is that response even possible? And I candidly even wrestle as I'm writing, is there something wrong with these Amish Christians? And almost immediately the Holy Spirit crashes into me and says, is there something right with them? Could it be, as Mark Twain expressed, Forgiveness be the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Could forgiveness be the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it? Church, as we grow deeper in community, as we seek to, to connect and do life together in our life groups that are launching and coming to church regularly, we do need to be intentional and we will see opportunity. As we love, may we be a people of great strength and humility who insist on forgiving extravagantly. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., may forgiveness not be an occasional act, but a constant attitude. Amen. So I hope you join us next week. We're going to look at how radical hospitality fosters connection, and specifically, how grace and truth are both at the, the heart and the core of Christian hospitality. And we're going we're gonna to learn from Jesus as he gets drawn into yet another conflict between church folks and a woman who's been sleeping around. I'll see you next week. <laughs> I laid that drop there on the end. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.